Hello everyone, it's such a pleasure to be here today to give this talk in Sadie's memory. I had the privilege of meeting Sadie in clinic. She was a bright, young, enthusiastic star. She sparkled and she always will do in all of our minds. Claire asked me to give a talk on food allergen cross reactions and associations and that gave me pause for thought. I thought that's an interesting talk and not one I've given before, but one that's so integral to our management of children in the allergy clinic and I think integral to you as parents looking after children with food allergy. So when we think about allergens and their associations, it's worth knowing that two thirds of children with food allergy react to more than one allergen. Being allergic to some foods will increase your risk of being allergic to others. In some incidences, this is a clinical association with an absence of shared allergens. Whereas in others, it's a biological association due to the presence of shared, what we call homologous proteins, meaning they have shared sequence identity. So an example of some clinical associations where the proteins um, are completely unrelated. So we know that in children with egg allergy, one in five of them will be nut allergic. So picking up these babies in clinic, we already know that we have to screen for nut allergy in a child presenting with their first reaction to egg. We know that in children who react to milk in a delayed fashion, and what I mean by delayed is reactions with reflux, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, that those children, one in two of them, will react to soya. So we would never replace cow's milk with soya. But if they react to cow's milk in an immediate fashion, with immediate onset symptoms, facial rash, swelling, then the incidence of cross-reactivity with soya is much lower. So 15% of those will actually be similarly allergic to soya. Here are some biological associations where we know that they are shared cross-reacting proteins. And one of the commonest ones we come across is parents um, unwittingly replacing cow's milk with goat's milk, which we know shares 92% of the shared allergens. So not a suitable milk to use in a child with milk allergy. We know that in children with peanuts, 40% of them react to tree nuts to, due to shared seed storage proteins. And if you're thinking about tree nuts and seeds, so sesame, sunflower seed, pumpkin seed, we know that the risk of being allergic to tree nuts and seeds goes up to 60% if you're peanut allergic. I mentioned with respect to milk allergy that reactions could be immediate and delayed and I think that's an important distinction. So what do we mean by this? So when you react immediately to a food, it's within minutes to two hours of ingesting the food. It leads to skin rash, so hives on the skin, swelling, vomiting, and then the worst cases are so-called symptoms of anaphylaxis, which is cough, wheeze, choking, wheezy, difficulty breathing, and a drop in blood pressure which leads to children becoming very floppy and drowsy. These symptoms tend to be reproducible, so every time you have the allergen, you have a reaction. The mechanism is well defined, the tests are usually positive, and in light of that, much easier to diagnose. When we think about delayed symptoms, the development of symptoms is up to 72 hours sometimes after the ingestion of the allergen. So symptoms can start within about six hours of ingestion, up to 72 hours. Symptoms are typically gut related and or eczema. So ingestion of a food protein on day one can lead to an eczema flare on day two or gut symptoms on day two. It's reproducible, but there is a threshold effect. So some children, for instance, can eat a certain amount of the food protein, but need a much larger amount of the protein to react. The mechanism is slightly unclear, and there are no validated tests making it very um, uh, difficult or harder to diagnose. And so these um, non-IgE mediated allergies really rely on a clinician's ability to recognize, to pattern recognize, and um, past experience of seeing these children come through clinic. When we think about the foods that cause immediate reactions, uh, we used to talk about the big eight, but it's now the big 10, with milk, egg, and nuts accounting for three quarters of reactions. You can see that in the pie diagram. 
followed by fish, shellfish, wheat, soya pulses, so things like lentils, chickpeas, much more frequent now. Sesame has become a big emerging allergen in the UK in recent years, and kiwi. Whereas the list for foods that cause delayed reactions is much shorter, and we usually just rely on these four food proteins. Occasionally we go outside of this, but it's normally milk, soya, eggs and gluten. And we've already mentioned that 50% of children who react to milk react to soya in a delayed fashion. But if you're wheat allergic with delayed reactions, you also have a higher probability of reacting to other gluten containing grains like barley, rye, and to a lesser degree oats. So I thought I'd take you into the clinic and go through three um, lovely patients that have come through clinic just to illustrate how some of these cross reactions and associations influence our decisions. So this young boy recently reacted to hummus and he developed immediate onset urticaria within 15 minutes of ingestion. He didn't have any breathing difficulties so he had a non-anaphylactic reaction. He received antihistamine and his reaction completely settled within two hours. When we explored the history, we, he gave a history of having previously been egg allergic, but had now outgrown that and was now tolerating eggs. But he had reacted to peanut at the age of two years, and he now avoids all nuts in his diet since then. So the index reaction was to hummus. What's in hummus? We think of chickpeas and sesame. And so I suppose the question is, in this child, what would the most likely allergen be? Is he allergic to sesame? Is he allergic to chickpea? Or is he allergic to both? So thinking about our associations and cross-reactions here, we know that he's peanut allergic. Peanut is a legume. So if he's allergic to peanut, what is his chance of being allergic to other legumes such as chickpea? And if he's peanut allergic, what is the chance of him being sesame allergic? So, in actual fact, even though peanut is in the same leguminous class of food proteins as chickpeas, the chance of this child being allergic to chickpea is only 5%, whereas his chance of being allergic to sesame is 25%. And if this little boy was allergic to peanuts and, say, cashew nuts, immediately the risk of being allergic to sesame goes up to 50%. So once again, in clinic, this is very much something we're looking for in children with nut allergy. So the clinical cross-reactivity between peanut and other legumes is low, but if he's chickpea allergic, his clinical cross-reactivity with lentils and peas would be relatively high. And just a little aside here, the clinical cross-reactivity of a child with nut allergy with coconut is incredibly low as well. So although it comes in as a, a in that nut family, it's, it's very low cross-reactivity. So he underwent skin testing and this gave some clarity to the diagnosis. He tested positive to peanut and just in a boy of six, anything greater than eight millimeters would confirm an allergy with greater than 95% probability. So we know based on these skin tests that he's peanut allergic, but he's also sesame allergic and um, tested negative to chickpea. Now occasionally we see children testing positive as well, so there can be dual positivity here. But he tested negative to chickpea, which was encouraging. And then also tested positive to another tree nut, cashew. So we could diagnose on the base of basis of this skin test that he's allergic to peanut and sesame, he's not allergic to chickpeas, they could safely go ahead and introduce chickpeas at home. But he is allergic to cashew nut based on a positive test. And based on our knowledge of cross-reactivities, we already know that he's got a very high probability of being allergic to pistachio nuts. So just looking at that, um, so children with cashew nut allergy their risk of being pistachio nut allergic is 85%. But if you're pistachio nut allergic, that's your index reaction, almost all of those children are cashew nut um, allergic. And we see similar patterns with walnuts and pecan nut. So 75% uh, of children allergic to walnuts are also allergic to pecan nuts. But the other way around, if you're pecan nut allergic, almost all of the children who are pecan nut allergic are going to be walnuts allergic. 
So this was the results from a recent study looking at which nuts provoke the most allergic reactions. And it was a European-wide um, study with centres in London, Valencia and, and Geneva. And you can see that the nuts that came up as the most prevalent nuts was peanuts, walnuts and cashew nuts. I think it was a surprise to me that walnuts came up so high because we see a lot of hazelnut coming through in clinic. And you'll see in the UK population there was quite a bit of hazelnut there. But the least uh, um, allergenic nut was almonds and Brazil nuts. I am seeing a bit of Brazil nut allergy coming through in clinic because Brazil nuts are packed with selenium, so it's been promoted as a health food at the moment, so we're seeing more of it coming through clinic at the moment. Pine nuts are technically not a nut, they're a seed, um, but nevertheless they're the least likely to cause allergy. And in this study, which was the pro-nut study, they looked at relative cross-reactivity between the nuts, and you'll see that cashew and pistachio are slightly on their own, they don't cross-react with the other nuts, whereas walnuts cross-reacts with hazelnuts and cross-reacts with macadamia, so there's much greater level of cross-reactivity amongst those nuts. So the second child from clinic is this five-month-old infant who's breast and bottle fed, and um, in the pandemic, I saw so many of these children coming through clinic. So eczema onset at two months, uh, recurrence despite the use of emollients and topical steroids. This child was also very uncomfortable, persistent crying, sleep disturbance, and suspected gastroesophageal reflux. So the parents were concerned about milk allergy and they'd switched from a cow's milk based formula to a lactose-free formula, and there had been no improvement in either the eczema or reflux. So I suppose the question to ask at this is, is this just eczema, or could this child be food allergic? What is the risk of this infant covered in eczema being food allergic? This was a lovely study carried out in Australia by a Melbourne group. And what they did is they stratified children into when they developed their eczema. Did they develop it during the first three months of life, during three to six months, six to nine, etc., or after the age of a year? And then the stratification was based on whether they used the green bar, no treatment, the orange bar, emollients only, the blue bar, 1% hydrocortisone, or the red bar, anything stronger than 1% hydrocortisone. So for those of you who have children with eczema, the sort of equivalent of Umivate or, or anything stronger than that. And you'll see that in children like this baby who developed their eczema within the first three months, that 50% were found to be food allergic if they'd used something stronger than 1%. But if they'd used only just something like 1% hydrocortisone, which is available in boots over the counter, your risk of being food allergic was around about 35%. So a relatively high risk. And the later you developed your eczema, the less likely you were to become food allergic. And the watershed was a year. So if you developed your eczema after a year, you were much less likely to be food allergic. So this child's risk of being food allergic was 50%. The most likely culprit allergens are milk, soya, egg, and nuts. Is lactose-free formula the right formula? I put it out that question to you. And the answer is absolutely no, because what lactose-free formula is is, is, is a milk where the milk sugar has been removed and all the milk proteins left behind. And in cow's milk, allergy in young infants covered in eczema with reflux and gut symptoms, it's always the milk protein we worry about. So replacing it with a lactose-free formula is not going to be helpful for that child. So lactose intolerance develops in older children after gastroenteritis. It's in some, it, it, it occurs in some racial groups genetically, but they usually present much older. So the infants reacting to milk are usually reacting to milk protein. Some of them marginally improve, and that's because they malabsorb the sugar as well but it doesn't solve the problem. So what about goat's sheep milk? Well, 92% cross-reactivity, we've al already mentioned that, so not suitable. We've already mentioned that um, soya milk is not suitable. 
But if you've got a donkey in the garden <laughs> and you can have access to mare's milk, the cross-reactivity is very low. So we occasionally come across that in clinic. What about formulas? Well, this child would require, if we were going to go on to formula, a hypoallergenic formula, and there are two levels, the one being an extensively hydrolyzed where the proteins are broken down, and that's tolerated by 90% of children with milk allergy. But we, sometimes we have to go on to the next level of formula called an amino acid-based formula, rather sort of expensive, unpalatable formulas, but nevertheless tolerated by most children with cow's milk allergy. I think plug for breastfeeding here, that breastfeeding is like feeding your child a hypoallergenic formula. So breast milk is, is, is an excellent um, um, feed that's low in allergenicity, and we would often work with the mother's breastfeeding and ask her to remove proteins from her diet, such as milk and egg in a child like this. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just to focus on the fact that when we're thinking about food allergic reactions, we're talking about immune-mediated reactions, and those are either the quick onset, the IgE-mediated or the non-IgE-mediated, whereas a lactose intolerance is actually not even uh, an immune-mediated reaction, it's an enzyme reaction, and it falls out of the, the remit of food allergy completely. So when this baby was introduced to solid foods and weaned, uh, she reacted immediately to egg with redness and urticaria, and when given salmon, she developed redness around her mouth and vomiting. The parents were frightened at this point to try new foods. They'd introduced chicken and pulses, they'd introduced a bit of oats and wheat, but they'd not yet tried nuts and sesame and were fearful of doing so. They were asking, should they avoid all forms of egg? They'd heard that some children can have baked egg and cakes and biscuits. Should they avoid all fish? And what about shellfish? So the question is, if allergic to hen's egg, are they going to be allergic to other eggs? And the answer is absolutely. These different forms of avian eggs, such as duck, quail, goose, share very similar cross-reacting proteins, but there's low cross-reactivity with chicken. So we don't normally advise not trying chicken in a child who's reacted to egg. Occasionally you'll get a child who reacts, but it's less than 5%. The next question was, well, what about other forms of egg, like baked egg? And that is because of this observation that heating or processing of egg can alter the allergenicity. So what we mean by that is some children need to see the whole protein to react. So the whole protein would be present, for example, in raw egg, whereas other children need to see only tiny little fragments of egg to react. So as you start cooking egg and baking it, you start breaking up these proteins into ever more smaller fragments and the child who's most allergic will react to those fragments in, within baked egg, whereas others won't. So 80% of children who are egg allergic are able to tolerate egg in baked goods, but the decision to introduce is very much a clinical one because there is a risk of an immediate reaction. And so usually that's done in hospital if you're doing it with high numbers. There may come a point where a clinician advises you to do it very gradually or slowly at home. This is just a slide showing you what we mean by those whole food proteins being folded and held together by covalent bonds, so-called conformational epitopes, versus allergens that are unfolded and sequential or linear. And these allergens differ between different proteins. So we know that milk, soya, wheat and egg are of the conformational protein type, i.e. can be destroyed by heating, whereas nuts, fish and shellfish are of the linear epitope type and they are completely heat stable and not destroyed by heating at all. In fact, the allergenicity of nuts is increased by roasting. 
This child reacted to salmon. We know that in fish, the major allergen is parvalbinin, and as I mentioned, it's a linear epitope, and it's not destroyed by heating. It's found in fish and mostly the white muscle of fish, and so it's higher in concentration in white fish such as cod um, than it is in fish such as salmon, mackerel, tuna, swordfish, which have red dark muscle, and that actually affects the allergenicity of fish. So we generally see white fish being more allergenic than oily fish, and the least allergenic fish of the lot is tuna. So there are many children who are able to tolerate tuna. But your chance of reacting to oily fish or white fish if you're allergic to one fish type is around 50%. So the clinical decision ahead of having these individual tests and challenges is usually to avoid all fish because the cross reactivity is pretty high. And that would then be teased out in a specialist allergy clinic. So what about shellfish allergy? So the major allergen in shellfish is tropomycin. And this is another heat-stable allergen, i.e. not destroyed by heating at all. Low cross-reactivity with fish or parvalbinin. So if you're fish allergic, you're highly likely to be able to have shellfish allergy. So a single skin test in clinic to shrimp would allow you to be able to introduce shellfish safely into your diet at home. That is not the case if you are allergic to any form of shellfish. So whether that be mussel or crab or prawn, your chance of being allergic to other shellfish is very high, so around 75%. So although you will meet individuals in clinic who can eat mussels who are shrimp allergic, they fall into the lucky 25% that can have mollusks but react to crustaceans. So this child underwent allergy skin prick testing and tested negative to milk and soya, but positive to egg. And at five months of age, a test above six millimeters on skin testing would make you have a high probability, 95% probability of being allergic. So the number is lower. And this child's allergy to cod and salmon, so oily fish and white fish was confirmed but tested negative to shrimp. So we would be able to say to this family that from the age of one, this child could have shellfish. Why from the age of one? Because shellfish tends to concentrate mercury and heavy metals, so it's not recommended to give to babies under the age of one. So what about that milk test? This baby tests negative and had presented with early onset eczema and reflux. And the parents had been concerned from the outset that the child was milk allergic, and we'd agreed that there was a very high probability. But now that we have this negative test, does that rule out milk allergy? And the answer is no. The clinical history strongly suggests that this child is reacting to milk, and so we would definitely recommend a trial of a dairy-free diet. So we subsequently placed this child on an extensively hydrolyzed formula. There was a reduction in eczema and reflux and um, improvement overall in symptoms. The child was advised to avoid all forms of egg and all forms of fish. And the reason why we did not go forward with any baked egg challenge is that we really want to gain control of that skin Barry in a very meaningful way before going down the route of a baked egg challenge and that would need for this child, given those numbers, to be hospital based. So we deferred that until after the first birthday. But the really good thing in this child is that they tested negative to peanuts and tree nuts. So on the basis of this, we were able to advise this family to introduce peanuts and tree nuts into the diet proactively and to give it then twice weekly or three times weekly regularly to promote tolerance. And where does that come from? Because this is a very new thing that's crept into this practice, this desire to introduce nuts early and keep them in the diet early. 
And it came from this study called the LEAP study, which showed fairly convincingly that early consumption of peanuts in young babies may prevent the onset of peanut allergy. So it was able to reduce the development of peanut allergy by 75%. So fairly marked reduction. And that's really because we see children developing their nut allergies due to exposure to nuts in their environment rather than the fact that they may be born with nut allergy. So they're developing their nut allergy due to environmental exposure. So the last case that we're going to talk about is a 13-year-old boy who has hay fever. Um, he's got a bit of mild asthma, but he's not known to be food allergic at all. But recently he's developed oral itching, so it's scratching in his tongue, back of his throat with raw apples, cherries and peaches. And as a secondary thing, he's, he's started to react to raw hazelnuts with similar itching in the back of his throat and, and palate, but he's able to eat Nutella. And he has most other nuts in his diet with no reactions. So his parents' question in clinic was, is he at risk of more severe reactions now that he's reacting to a nut? And really what we're talking about in this boy is that he's got the pollen food syndrome, where he's reacting to shared cross-reacting proteins between pollens in trees and grass, commonly birch pollen, and shared fruits that cross-react with these pollens. So the symptoms that pollen food syndrome cause are usually very localized. Occasionally you can get a bit of lip swelling, occasionally a rash around the mouth, but never anything more significant than that. So you wouldn't, for instance, get swelling of your eye, you wouldn't get breathing difficulty. It's due to these shared proteins, which are very heat unstable. So the minute you start cooking the fruit or canning it or processing it, it denatures the allergen and the child's able to eat the food. So a typical example is they react to raw apples, but can have cloudy apple juice and they can have apple crumble, so apple pie without reacting. So what about this child? He's also reacting to nuts, and we'll come on to that in a minute. But there are some children who have pollen food syndrome. So they have localized itching, itching, swelling of their tongue, back of throat, who carry on reacting to the food protein even when it's heated. So a typical example, and this is very common in Spain with peach. So it doesn't matter if the peach is cooked or processed or canned, these children still react to the protein and can react more severely. So they can even have anaphylaxis. So the reactions can progress beyond these localized trivial symptoms and cause anaphylaxis. And that's due to the presence of this small protein that we find called lipid transfer protein. Very common in southern Mediterranean countries where the the foods causing those reactions are often peach, cherries, and curiously, tomato sometimes causes reactions, whereas in Northern Europe and Britain, we very rarely see LTP allergy. It's quite infrequent, certainly in our pediatric population. So this is just a chart sharing with you the foods which cross-react to certain pollens. So when you've got a child who's tree pollen allergic, we see that birch pollen crossing, reacting, cross-reacting with most of the stone fruits. As I said, peaches, plums, cherries, apricots. You, we, we, it's very common, and apples and pears are common. But I've put in green here the nuts, so you can also see hazelnut coming up there. Grass pollens less commonly cross-react, but we get watermelons, melons, um, and peanut is a big one to cross-react with um, grass pollen, and then. Um, Ragweed is a common one with melon and banana. So this child's reacting to raw hazelnut, but he can have Nutella, and that's because he's reacting to this PR10 shared protein that uh, um, basically is heat unstable, and when you roast the hazelnut to put in the Nutella, he's tolerating it, but when you give him a raw hazelnut, he's reacting to it. So his 
his, it's a secondary nut allergy, not a primary nut allergy. His reactions are likely to stay trivial at low risk of anaphylaxis, and so he doesn't need an EpiPen. The allergy tests in pollen food syndrome are usually positive, so if you're reacting to a fresh fruit and you bring the fruit into clinic, we will test and you will usually react, test positive. The allergen skin test reagents are very unreliable because the allergen is so unstable that the skin test solutions don't pick it up, so we need to test with fresh fruit. Um, but the IgE test, the blood test, can be very helpful in identifying primary from secondary allergy, and that's particularly relevant for nuts. And so I'm going to leave you with this chart that really sort of summarizes the cost reactions we've talked about. Starting at the top, you can see that if you're legume allergic, what your risk of reacting to other legumes is. If you're um, nut allergic, what your risk is of reacting to other tree nuts, fish and other fish, and so forth. And we drop down to the bottom of the chart and I'll just finish off by saying the one thing we haven't touched on is the latex fruit syndrome. And we know that in those individuals who are latex allergic, you're more likely to react to certain fruits. And those fruits group together, and those groups are kiwi, avocado, and banana. So if you see a child who's coming in with kiwi allergy, we always ask about banana and avocado as well and test if they haven't yet ingested it. Uh, but the other way around is much lower, so if you're allergic to kiwi, your risk of being allergic to latex is only 11%. Um, so I thank you very much for your attention and for listening to this, and I know that there will be some opportunity going forward to pose your questions, and I'd very happily answer them. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.